Okay, I'll get started. Wanted to begin with the first announcement for test two, and I'll carry it on in the next class, and I'll carry it on in the class next week. Uh, so test two is next Thursday, so that's March 7th. And just like test one, it'll be in here. It'll be one hour in length. Test, test two has the same format as test one, so you're going to get... Um, 10 true-false questions, like you got 10 true-false questions on test one. That's worth 20 points, or 20%. And then you'll get three long problems, fully worked out problems, that together count for 80%, or 80 points. So exactly the same format. There is a practice test in um, a Canvas directory in modules. Uh, there's one with the solutions and with one without the solutions. You'll also work on the practice test in um, the recitation class next Monday, like you did prior to uh, test one. Uh, the formula sheet is in the uh, modules directory. It's the same formula sheet as you had for test one. Uh, the material is all the material since test one. So here's a list of it. We, after test one, introduced the idea of magnetism, uh, magnetic attraction, repulsion, magnetic north-south poles, magnetic fields. We then talked about the um, magnetic forces on currents or, or charged particles in magnetic fields. That was the field equation. Uh, we then talked about the magnetic fields that are created by currents, currents in straight wires, loops of wires, solenoids. We had equations for those. Last class, we talked about the magnetic flux, and especially changing magnetic flux, creating induced EMFs, creating induced currents. That was Faraday's law. In the next three classes, we're going to be, it's a bit like what we did for um, test one. After introducing sort of electricity, we looked at applications of electricity. Here, after introducing uh, magnetism, we're going to be looking at some apl important applications of magnetism. Uh, today's class, we're going to focus on um, electrical generators, electrical motors. That's a, a, a absolutely important application. Next class, we'll be uh, focusing on uh, wireless communication. That's an absolutely important um, application. And then uh, in the final class before uh, the test two, we'll, we'll put together our work on electricity and magnetism and see that it actually explains light. And that's a very fundamental discovery. So that's the content for test two. Any questions on all that? Okay, then I'll proceed. So as I mentioned, last class, we introduced Faraday's law for electromagnetic induction. It was that a changing magnetic field or magnetic flux creates an induced EMF or induced current. In this class, we're going to be looking at examples, uh, examples of uh, Faraday's law and induction. And the examples we're going to be focusing on in this class are where there are moving parts, moving components, or moving circuits. Um, the two examples I want to focus most on are one where we have translational motion. So that's just sort of motion in a straight line, left-right motion, something like that. Uh, translational motion in a uh, magnetic field can and generate an induced current, an in, uh, induced voltage, and it acts like an electrical generator. And so we'll explore um, that context for uh, generating electrical energy, electrical power, electrical currents, electrical voltages. We'll then look at a second example uh, that involves rotational motion. We've got, um, we're going to have currents rotating in a magnetic field. 
Uh, that also causes induction and induce currents and induce the EMFs. Uh, and that's another way, a more practical way of generating electrical energy, electrical power. And so we'll look at this example here. As we look at these two examples of electrical generators with translational motion and electrical generators with rotational motion, we'll, we'll discuss two equations one that describes the translational motion case. It'll be this equation here. I'll explain it. And then one that describes the rotational motion case. It'll be this equation here. I'll explain that too. So these are the two equations you're going to meet in, in this class. As I say, you know, this discovery uh, by Faraday of induction was both a scientific revolution in understanding electricity and magnetism, but it also was this huge technological windfall. It's how we make um, electrical energy and electrical power is through induction. Uh, and that's, that's really this class is about, how we make electrical energy, electrical power, electrical currents and electrical voltages. Okay. So I did want to make one point about Faraday's law. I, I wrote it up here. Remember, it's that the induced EMF is the negative rate of change of the magnetic flux. Sort of a mouthful, but we can express it this way. It's one equation, but it's a very interesting equation in physics. So the physicists love this equation. I mean, I absolutely love it because it's really quite unlike a lot of other equations. This equation, one equation, describes two different distinct effects. And one of those effects we're looking at in this class is this effect where, um, which involves motion and um, moving currents or moving charges in magnetic fields, um, uh, generating electrical energy, electrical power. But it also incorporates another effect, which says no motion, in which case a time-dependent magnetic field, a changing magnetic field, creates induced currents, induced EMF. So it's really... Um, an amazing equation that we're going to spend the whole week on because it's one equation with two effects embedded in it. It's one equation that leads us to electrical generators, which is so important. It's a, a, one equation that leads us also to wireless communication that's so important. Okay, so let, let me just first say uh, a little bit about, so what are electrical generators? And a related topic, what are electrical motors? So. In electrical generators, we might think of coal or oil, other fossil fuels. We might think of um, wind generators. We might think of hydro generators. We might think of uh, nuclear power plants. Those, those are all examples of ways of generating electrical energy and electrical power. Common to all those examples from the fossil fuels through the renewable wind and um, water uh, to the nuclear, common to all of them is that they actually turn motion, so kinetic energy, into um, currents, electrical currents, electrical energy. And so that's what an electrical generator is really. That's our notion of electrical generator. It's something that turns, um, elect turns motion, kinetic energy, into currents, electrical energy. The electric motor is really the reverse of that. In the electric motor, we turn uh, electrical energy, we turn that electrical energy, that electrical current, into uh, motion, kinetic energy. So we go in the opposite di direction in the motor, turning uh, kinetic energy into electrical energy from the generator, which turned kinetic energy into electrical energy. So that's what, that's what a motor is, and you know, we use motors. Motors are very important in our modern day lives, like cars now, we've got electric cars, we've got electric scooters, uh, the dryer, right? Dry your clothes, that's a, that needs an electrical motor. Um, the, the blender, when I make my milkshakes, that needs an um, uh, electric motor. And so electric motors are everywhere. And so they too are a huge technological development. Okay, so let's get on to these two examples. Um, basically, the rest of the class is 
the example of an electrical generator using translational motion to turn kinetic energy into electrical energy, and then the example of um, uh, an electrical generator using rotational motion that will turn rotational kinetic energy into electrical energy. We'll explore those two cases, we'll meet these two formulas, we'll get to understand how we make electrical power, how we make electrical energy. Okay. So this is a electrical generator both based on translational motion. And it, it does turn motion, kinetic energy, into currents, electrical energy. So that's how this, this functions. It has several components. It has let me describe the um, physical components here. It, it has these two rails. So there's a rail upstairs in gray and a rail downstairs in gray. And they're conducting rails. They're metal rails, see. So it's got these two horizontal rails in this picture. Uh, it's got a, a rod, a metal rod, that is vertical in this picture. We're going to slide it along the rails from the left to right. And there is a circuit involving the rails and the rod that's completed by this wire and resistor over here on the far left. So together, the bottom rod, the right-hand rail, the top rod, and the uh, left-hand wire and resistor make a complete circuit. That circuit, that arrangement, is immersed in a magnetic field. These, these uh, green crosses here are lines of magnetic field that by our conventionists um, are streaming into the screen away from you. So this is a region of magnetic field. It's a, nice, it's a region of nice uniform magnetic field. So, so how does this device work in generating electrical currents, electrical voltages, electrical power uh, from motion? Well, what you do is you would grab hold of that rod and you would move it from the left to the right. As you grab hold of that rod and move it from the left to the right, so that's the motion, there's a magnetic flux, there's a magnetic field passing through the circuit. And as you move the rod from left to right, you're increasing the area of the circuit, you're increasing the amount of magnetic field lines, magnetic flux that pass through the circuit. And so the motion is changing the flux through the circuit, the number of field lines through the circuit. Well, what does Faraday's law tell us about that? What does induction tell us about that? It says that that will cause an induced current, an induced EMF. And that's how we turn that motion into electrical currents, electrical energy, is turning um, the original kinetic energy of me moving the rod from left to right is turning that energy into electrical energy, into electrical power. So this is how this generator works. Now, I should say that this, we, we talk about this generator because it's a, a relatively straightforward geometry of generator. It's not a very practical generator. You know, this is not happening in a nuclear power station. They're not moving rods to and fro along rails. It doesn't work as a practical generator, but it's very, um, it's, it's very instructive as a demonstration generator. So that's why we're discussing this one. I want to show you it in practice. Because we have one of these. So here are four very strong magnets. The magnetic field across the surface of these magnets is a, a very large magnetic field. And so there's a, a very large number of magnetic field lines that are coming out of these magnets into the space above. Uh, this aluminium rod he, uh, rail here, this aluminium rail here, are the two rails in the sketch, in the diagram. So those are the rails. and. Um, I'm going to make up a complete circuit by having a rod on these rails. So this is the rod in the picture above. And then 
here's two leads, a red one and a black one, um, they're not connected to a resistor, but rather they're connected to something with resistance which will tell us the current or the induced EMF. And so we can demonstrate the generation of electrical energy, electrical current, electrical voltages with this generator if, I'm, if I move this guy along the rail. So watch the needle as I move this rod from the left to the right. So it's a small deflection. It is a small deflection, and it's not a practical way of turning um, kinetic energy. That's what I'm putting in. I'm putting in kinetic energy. It's not a practical way of turning kinetic energy into a electrical energy. Uh, but it is a, a way that we can understand that transformation of kinetic energy into electrical energy. If I, I can move it the other way too, I can reduce the flux through the circuit and the rod deflects a little bit but in the other direction because I'm, I'm changing the flux in the opposite direction. So again, if I move it that way from right to left, the needle deflects towards the right. So that's a... Uh, I've tied myself up with a gas here. Uh, uh, that's the electrical generator that we're talking about. And so now let's see if we can understand how it works in detail. Okay, so here's our sketch again, but on this sketch I've added the formula that describes the induced EMF for this type of electrical generator. So I've added this formula here. And obviously with Ohm's law we could also, if we knew the induced EMF, we could figure the induced current through Ohm's law, the relationship between the current and the current and the voltage. Um, the induced EMF is given by this equation here. So this applies to this particular arrangement this particular generator. This is not a general equation. This is a specific equation for this particular, particular arrangement, uh, 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 electrical generator. It says that the induced EMF is the product of the magnetic field here, the length of the rod, we denoted it L here, and the speed at which you move the rod. That's uh, denoted V here. So it depends on the product of these three things. Now, this has come out of a hat. A uh, like rabbit has come out of a hat. But can I explain it? Yeah, I can explain it. Um, each of those three ingredients, B, L, and V, each of those three ingredients, if you increase them, it's pretty obvious they would increase the, the rate of change of flux through the circuit. If you were to decrease any of those three ingredients, B, L, and V, it would, it's, it's pretty obvious, I think, and we'll see it, that would decrease the rate of change of flux. So those are the three things, B, L, and V, that change the flux uh, through the circuit. And so those are the three things that the induced EMF that is equal to the rate of change of flux depends on. So for example, supposing I increase the magnetic field, we get more field lines. Then when I move the rod from left to right, I'd be changing the flux more, correspondingly more. So I'd expect that increased magnetic field, I get a, a bigger induced EMF, a bigger induced current. Obviously, if I turn the magnetic field off, there would be no induction. There would be no induced EMF. There would be no induced current. So it must depend on the magnetic field. Um, what about the speed, V, that I'm moving the rod from left to right? Well, obviously, if I move it really slowly from left to right, I'm only very gradually changing the flux because I'm only very gradually increasing the area enclosed by the circuit. So I'd expect a small V, uh, a small induced EMF. If I could move that rod really fast, I couldn't really do that. If I could move it really fast from left to right, I could change the um, area of the circuit very quickly. I'd change the flux through the circuit much more quickly. I'd get a, a, a larger induced EMF. And so it, it makes sense that it depends on the, um, the velocity V. Finally, that length, that length of the rod. Imagine we made the rod twice the length. If we made it twice the length, right, it would capture in the circuit twice as many field lines. And so when I move the rod, I would be changing the flux by twice as much. If I made the rod only half the length, it would capture only half the number of field lines. And therefore, if I move the rod, 
it would change the flux by only half the amount. So it also makes sense that the induced EMF depends on the, uh, the length of the rod. And so these are, we just argued this equation. We didn't formally derive it, but we just argued these must be the three things in this generator that the induced EMF depends on. And the equation is that the induced EMF is BLV. Let me make a point. This might seem a bit of a silly point right now, but it's going to come up as a point when we go on to the rotational motion. Um, if I was able to, you know, make a practical generator with this guy here, where I would just move the rod uh, at constant speed from left to right, that would generate what we call direct current. It would generate a constant EMF if I move the rod with constant velocity. And this is what we call direct current. And here I've even gone to the trouble, you might be surprised, of picturing what that would look like. Horizontally is the time axis, vertically is the induced EMF from this type of generator, and it would be a constant EMF I move with, if I move with constant velocity, and that EMF is just given by BLV. So as I say, this is a direct current electrical generator, and this will be a reference point for our rotational motion electrical generator. Right, let's look at an example problem, see if I can do this. Uh, so in, in this particular example, we're talking about this generator again. Here's the same picture. Uh, we're told that the rod is 35 centimeters long. And we're told that it's pushed across the rails at some speed. Uh, and we're told that it's pushed across the rails in a, a 0.3 Tesla magnetic field. What we discover when we do this is that we get a current of 8.5 milliamps flowing through a resistor of 9 ohms. So we've got a current in here. We're generating an induced current. We're generating an induced EMF. And we're told what that current is. The question is, there's several questions here. What is the speed of the rod? What speed of rod made this induced current? First question. Second question is, uh, what force do we have to apply to the rod? to move the rod from the left to the right. Or maybe even did we have to apply a force on the rod to move it left to right? So we're going to look at the force we applied on the rod. And then finally, what power do we put in to this generator with, through the motion? Uh, what power do we get out of this generator that is supplied electrically out of this generator? So we're going to look at the power that goes in that's through the motion. The power that comes out, that's through the um, uh, electric flow of electrical current. So let's work out all these things. Um, I'll do it on the document camera. And I already started it. I, d I drew the sketch. So in my sketch, I, I have the uh, two rails, upstairs and downstairs, the rod moving on the rails, the circuit completed by the resistor over here on the uh, left, left hand side. I've annotated the sketch with all the quantities that I know. So I know the, um, I, let's start over here. I know the resistor in the circuit, it was 9 ohms. I was told the current that's flowing is 8.5 milliamps. So that's the induced current. I, I wasn't actually directly told it, but I, I knew I was going to want it. This is, an, this is the induced EMF. It's just gotten with Ohm's law, multiplying the resistance in the current, gives us the induced voltage that was created. So if I multiply 8.5 by 9, I get 76 millivolts. So I wrote this information down because basically we're told it. Um, also, we know the length of the rod and we know the magnetic field. 0.35 meters, 0.3 Tesla. So I added all those things. That's my picture. And the first thing I wanted to know about, it didn't work. First thing I want to know about was what is the velocity of the rod if I'm creating this particular induced current, this particular induced EMF. So let's see if I can figure that out. Okay. 
So this is an example of using Faraday's law of induction, because that's the cause of the induced current, induced EMF, but using the equation for Faraday's law of induction that says the rate of change of the flux, magnetic flux, is equal to BLV. So we're going to use that particular brand of Faraday's law that applies to this particular uh, electrical generator. So let, let's start with that point. I'm only going to worry right now about the size of the EMF. We'll talk about the, the direction of the current later on. So I'm just going to worry about how big or small the EMF is. And it's just the product of the sizes of the magnetic field, the length of the rod, and the uh, velocity uh, of the rod. We want, though, the velocity. We, we want the velocity. We know the three other quantities, the induced EMF. We know the magnetic field. We know the length of the rod. So I'm just going to turn this around, first of all. Uh, if I turn it around, just got to divide by B and L. And then I can just plug in the numbers, right? I've got an induced EMF that's 76 millivolts. So that's 0 0.076 volts. I've got a magnetic field that was 0 0.3 Tesla. And also in the denominator, I've got the length of the rod. That's uh, 0 0.35 meters. And uh, if I take that 0 0.076, divide it by the 0 0.3, divide it by the 0 0.35, that's going to give me a, uh, a, a speed in meters per second. And it was 0 0.75, 0 0.73 actually, meters per second. So that's, that's the first part of the problem. We figured out the speed at which the rod is moving from left to right to generate this particular induced current, this particular induced EMF. Obviously, if I had a bigger induced EMF, bigger induced current with this setup, I'd have to be pushing the rod faster. If I had a smaller induced EMF, induced current, I'd have to be pushing the rod slower. Um, next step. Next step, we wanted the applied force. Do I have to push the rod? That's what the question is really answering. Do I have to push the rod to keep it moving at constant velocity? And uh, how hard do I have to push the rod? Well, you do have to push the rod. A current is flowing through the rod. That rod is in a magnetic field. That creates a magnetic force. That magnetic force opposes the motion of the rod. It wants to slow it down. We have to push to counteract that to keep the rod moving at constant velocity. So that's a lot of words that I said uh, that I chained together. Let me explain. Um, let me explain the 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 direction of the current that's flowing in the rod. Explain the direction of the magnetic force on the rod, and hence the direction of the applied force on the rod. So we know there's a current flowing in this circuit upstairs here. Um, right now it could be clockwise or counterclockwise, but we can figure out whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise with, with Lenz's law and the right-hand rule. So Lenz's law says that whatever current flows will make an induced magnetic field that opposes the change. The change is from the current, the, the original magnetic field, is that as the rod moves to the right, more and more field lines are passing through the circuit into the, into the page. So the induced magnetic field must be a magnetic field that comes out of the page. It's going to work to try and counteract that change. So the induced magnetic field is going to come out of the page. If the induced magnetic field comes out of the page, so let, let me use my thumb as the induced magnetic field. That's coming out of the page. That's opposing the change by Lenz's law. My fingers will curl in the direction of the current around the circuit, around the loop, around the rectangular circuit that creates that current, that's, that field that's coming out of the page. So they're, if you look, they're, they're curling uh, counterclockwise. And so my current flows counterclockwise, which means, for example, it's going to flow up on the right-hand arm of the circuit. So that was a very important bit of reasoning, right? There, we knew there was a current flowing around the circuit. That's the electrical generator. The question is, did it go clockwise or counterclockwise? We had to get put together Lenz's law, which tells you the direction of the induced EMF, um, uh, 
and the induced current. We're going to put that together with, um, we put it together with the right hand rule for a current in a current loop, making a magnetic field to figure out this direction of the current here. So that's what we just did. Um, now we've got uh, an interesting situation because we've got a current that's flowing up the screen. It's in a magnetic field that points in towards the screen. So we've got a current that's perpendicular to the magnetic field. That's going to create a magnetic force. Um, that magnetic force we can get with the original version of the right hand rule, which represented the field equation. It related the direction of the current the direction of the magnetic field and the direction of the magnetic force. So I'm going to point my palm of my hand, right hand, in the direction of the current. That's up. I'm going to curl my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. That's into the screen. My thumb is going to point in the direction of the force. That's towards the left. There is a force, a magnetic force, on the rod because it is a current carrying rod in a magnetic field and it is perpendicular to the current, it's perpendicular to the magnetic field, it's towards the left. So let me draw that. This is FB. It's over here towards the left. Okay, so now we got that there's a magnetic force acting on the rod in this problem. Um, if that was the only force acting on the rod, then what would the rod do? The rod would slow down. That force would kind of resist the motion towards the right, it would slow the rod and stop the rod. So we have to apply our own force to counteract it, to keep it moving at constant velocity. I'll call that VFA, the applied force. And so our force is towards the right. That's why we have to push the rod towards the right. Look, I, that's a whole story I've just told you. It's put together a whole bunch of reasoning it's not an easy story and not an easy amount of reasoning, um, but it's a very important sort of trail that leads us to the solution of this problem. We now realize at the end of that story that we've got a magnetic force acting towards the um, uh, left in this uh, generator. We must be pushing towards the right in this generator. Uh, we can now figure out what the size of the applied force is because it must be balancing the magnetic force and we have an equation for the magnetic force on a current carrying wire it's just BLI the product of the field the current and the length of the rod um, times sine theta and in this case you know sine theta is the angle between the field and the current in this case they're at right angles as often is so this guy's just one Notice I put um, vertical lines around FA, FB. Uh, I've already told you the direction. I'm just worrying about the size now. We know the directions to the left, to the right. We know they're opposing each other. We know they're balanced. Um, we just need the size. How big are these forces? Well, I've just got to take the magnetic field now. That's 0.3 Tesla. I've got to multiply it by the length of the rod. That's 0.35 meters. I've got to multiply it by the current that's flowing in the rod. What was that? That was uh, 8.5 milliamps. 0.0085 amps and after all that I'm going to get a, um, a force and that force is uh, 8.9 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons and so we figured out the magnetic force it's a tiny force you know it's a it's less than a, a, a thousandth of a millinewton, so it is a tiny force. The uh, applied force to keep the motion going is also a tiny force. It's the same size, just opposite direction. And we figured out these forces. Okay, um, completely lost where I am. What was the last part of the question? Power supplied and power dissipated. We said at the when we first introduced what a generator is, it's something which you put in kinetic energy, put in the power of motion, and you get out electrical energy, you get out uh, electrical power. So that's what it, the purpose of a generator is. So we better look at the power we're putting in, the power we're getting out, because that's the whole point of this generator. Um, so the power that's put into the generator is put into the generator by the force that I'm applying. 
I'm applying a force to keep the object moving. And so that's the power that goes into the generator. Um, the power that comes out of the generator, how are we going to see that? Well, that power that comes out of the generator creates a current, flows through a resistor, and it warms up the resistor. It dissipates power in the resistor. And that's how we're going to see the power dissipated in the, um, uh, the electrical power in the circuit through the power that's dissipated as heat in the resistor. Um, let me show you the two equations that I'm going to, well, let me go through that argument. So power supplied, that's what this P subscript S means. This is the power supplied by the motion. Um, if you apply a force uh, on an object moving with some velocity, and I'm applying a force, an applied force on the rod moving with some velocity V, the product of the force and the velocity is the power that you're supplying. This, is a, a, this equation is a friend to the work done. It's like work done on the rod is equal to the force I applied to the rod times the distance it moves. This is the power version of that. It's the, the, um, the power supplied to the rod is the force I apply on the rod times the speed of the rod. Anyway, we just got to move these, uh, multiply these two things to find out the um, uh, power supply. So it's um, 8.9 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons times the velocity. That was uh, 0.73 mil, uh, milliseconds, uh, meters per second, going nuts. Um, and if I multiply those together, I got, um, I, I'm going to write it in milliwatts. It's 0.65 milliwatts. That's um, 6.5 times 10 to the minus 4 watts. So that's the power we're putting in. You know, the force that we applied and the magnetic force were really small. The scale of um, milli newtons. Uh, that means that the power's, power we're supplying and the power that's going to be dissipated is also going to be really small. It's going to reflect that. That, that whole, this whole thing that the, the power in, the power out, um, the forces in, the force out are so small is reflecting the fact that this is a totally, totally impractical electrical generator. It's just one that we can build a simple equation for and a complete and full understanding for. Okay, so that's the power in. What about power? I'm going to call it power dissipated. The way I'm going to see the electrical power is that it, it gets dissipated in the resistor by warming up, by heating up the resistor. The dissipated power in the resistor, this is one of our equations for power in electrical circuits, is given by I squared R. So remember the power in a circuit component, you can write it as IV, product of current and voltage. Uh, or you can replace an I with a V over R, or you can replace a, um, a V with an IR. And so I squared R is just IV with the V replaced by an IR. Um, I, I did that because we know the current. Uh, the current was, um, let's see, 8.5 milliamps. So that's 0 0.0085 amps squared times the resistance, 9 ohms. And this is a miracle, but it's not really a miracle. If you multiply that out, try it, you get 0.65 milliwatts. What we're seeing is the flow of the energy through this generator. We're putting in um, 6.65 milliwatts of power. That's, that's goes in as motion of the rod, it gets turned into electrical energy, and then it gets dissipated as heat energy, and we're seeing the amount of heat that we're producing, 0.65 milliwatts. In all that process of kinetic energy to electrical energy to heat energy, you can't, um, you can't fail to conserve energy. You can't destroy energy. You can't create any energy. So we just conserve it, and so whatever we put in is whatever we get out at the end. We've just proved that to ourselves. Okay. So that's a, as I say, it's a nice example of electrical generator, not because it's a useful electrical generator, but, but you can really follow from the very beginning of how it works through induction. All the steps to how it turns motion and power, mechanical power, into el electrical currents and electrical energy. Yeah. So like if the magnetic field is having a force in the opposite direction, and we apply the why does the rod move? 
Well, the rod is, okay, so in this arrangement here, we're keeping the rod going at constant velocity. So it, it was going at 0.73 meters per second, and we wanted to maintain that velocity. So to maintain that velocity, what we realized was that there was a magnetic force that was trying to slow it down. So we had to apply a counter force to keep it going at constant velocity. So it's a very important question, good question. Those two forces there are in equilibrium, they're equal and opposite, so that the net force is zero, so that the rod moves at constant speed, which is what we were told in the problem. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a very good point to bring up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, skip all that. Um, because that's just, uh, I'm not skipping content. Uh, that's, that's just me working through it on the other. Uh, let's move on to rotational motion. Uh, so let's look at a practical generator. This is how generators in that... Oh, thank you. What am I doing? I mean, this thing is not very complicated. There's a button that says computer. There's a button that says document camera. But somehow in my hands, it becomes um, unmanageable. Anyway, we're back to the slides. Um, we're going to turn now not translational motion into electrical power. We're going to turn rotational motion into electrical power. This is what happens in the coal, fire, uh, coal power station, or the oil fire power station, or the uh, nuclear power plant power plant, or the wind turbine, or the hydro, you know, the dam, or whatever that's hydropower. It happens in all of those cases. Um, wrong way. Here is the rotational version of a electrical generator, in which a rotational motion is and rotational energy is turned into electrical energy, electrical power. Uh, let me just explain the uh, components of this arrangement here. Uh, let me start with the electrical circuit. In gray here is a wire, and that wire forms a turn of wire in this region here. And here are the two terminals of that wire that can be connected to a uh, a light or a resistor as we generate electrical energy, electrical power, electrical voltages. In practice, right, this, this single turn of wire would be many turns of wire. You'd have, you know, a hundred, a thousand turns of wire to, to create a large induced EMF, large induced current, a, a large electrical power. So anyway, we've got this loop of wire and um, the motion that we're going to put into this arrangement is that it's not we're going to translate it left or right. We're going to rotate it. We're going to rotate it about its axis. And actually, in electrical generators, they, th these uh, loops of wire, these coils of wire, are rotated very fast in um, electrical generators. Uh, so they might, uh, if you rotate them at 60 times a second, you would actually get the 60 cycles per second power out of a wall socket. So uh, that's, that was, that's rotating a coil pretty fast if you rotate it 60 times a second. It's 377 radians per second if you figure it out. Anyway, we're rotating this uh, loop of wire very fast. Um, if we just did it in empty space, well, that's fine, but you're not going to create any electrical energy, electrical power. You do that rotation in a magnetic field. And so we've also got in this sketch a North Pole and a South Pole, a magnetic field where the field lines stream from the North Pole to the South Pole. And so you can see that some of these field lines are streaming through this loop. So that's the geometry. Imagine focusing on as that coil rotates around in that magnetic field. Imagine focusing on the number of field lines passing through the loop. Imagine focusing on the magnetic flux that's passing through the loop. If in that sketch the um, coil was kind of standing vertically, here's the, the top of it, here's the bottom of it, 
then it would capture a lot of field lines. They'd all stream through the coil. If at another moment later, right, it's turned to be horizontal, the coil's now horizontal, the field lines are streaming across the top, they're streaming across the bottom, there's none going through the loop. So as the coil rotates, constantly the number of field lines through the coil, through the loop, is changing. That's a, a changing number of field lines through the loop, that's a changing flux through the loop, that's going to create an induced EMF and induced current through the loop, and that's how we generate electrical power, electrical energy with this, um, with this arrangement. So that's how it works. Uh, let me show you, I'm not going to show you a demonstration, I'm going to show you a video of this one. Okay, let me actually pause this because it goes really fast um, and explain. So, in this picture, there are several components. There is a coil of wire. It's located here. It has many turns. It has thousands of turns, I think, this coil of wire. This coil of wire uh, is on an axle that kind of comes into and out of the screen and it can be rotated by a handle that's on the other side of this wheel. So you'll see, I, I got my assistant um, to turn this handle and uh, turning that handle rotates very fast this, um, this coil here and that coil uh, of wire is rotating in a magnetic field. So here's a, um, a, a magnetic north pole in red, here's a magnetic south pole in green, and that coil, the, these poles are kind of extended with these arms, uh, either side of the coil, and that coil rotates in a magnetic field. So the flux will be changing through that coil. That changing flux, that changing number of field lines through that coil will create an induced EMF, create an induced, um, induced current, and um, uh, we'll use it, there's a light bulb here, hard to see in this picture, but in a moment I'll turn the lights out here. We'll light that lamp. And so we will be generating, in some sense, useful electrical energy, useful electrical power to light a light bulb. So let's see how that goes. Okay, so here I come along and I'm going to point out the magnet. North Pole, South Pole, I'm going to point out the coil, it's free to rotate on that axis. And then I'm going to walk around the other side of the desk, I think. And then, oh, I'm going to show you, I can turn the handle, awkwardly, and rotate the coil. And actually, as you can see here, because I'm turning a big wheel, and on the coil there's a small wheel, I can turn that coil extremely fast. And you might see the light glow then. But actually I'm going to now, because it was a little hard to see, let's turn the, turn the lights off. I'm going to do the same thing. You've barely seen me turn the handle, but look at that light. I built an electrical generator that's generating useful electrical energy, useful electrical power to power a light in my home. And so um, that's the principle of all the electrical generators that we use for the national power grid. Um, all of the ones based on coal or oil or gas uh, uh, wind and uh, water and nuclear, they all work this way. They're bigger, um, but they work this way. Right, where am I going? So, just like in the um, translational motion generator, there was an equation based on Faraday's law of induction, based on that the induced EMF is equal to the negative rate of change of the magnetic flux, that described that generator. That was the BLV. In this rotational case, 
there's a, an equation that's based on Faraday's law of induction, based on the fact that the um, rate of change of the magnetic flux d determines the induced EMF that describes this type of generator. And that's the equation that I've written up here. So here it is. And let's just walk through the ingredients in this equation. So um, one of them, so th this is the equation for the induced EMF. One of the things on the right-hand side is the magnetic field. And so that's, that's probably pretty obvious. The magnetic field was important in the um, linear motion generator. It's important, it's the key in the rotational motion generator because we've got to generate a, a changing flux. And so it's in proportion to the magnetic field in this region here. If you make that, um, make that field bigger, you're going to create um, a larger induced EMF, larger induced current. If you make a smaller, smaller induced EMF, smaller current. So that, that seems very natural. A, this uppercase A, that's the area of the loop. That's the number of square centimeters or square millimeters or square meters of this rectangular loop that's bathed in this magnetic field. <coughs> the bigger the area of the loop, then the more induced EMF, induced current you'll get. The smaller the area of the loop, the smaller the induced EMF, induced current you'll get. That makes sense too, right? We're trying to capture field lines so that we can, we can watch a, a, a greater rate of change of the number of field lines, the magnetic flux through the circuit. The more field lines we capture, the, um, the, the greater the induced EMF. The less field lines we capture, the smaller the induced EMF. It's the area of the loop that does the capturing, captures the field lines. So the bigger the area, the more field lines we capture, the more rate of change of field lines we'll, we'll see. And so it, it makes sense it depends on the area A. Uh, it's sort of analogous to the, um, uh, in the case of the linear motion, uh, the induced EMF, induced current, depended on the length of the rod. Again, if you make a longer rod, shorter rod, you're either going to make a um, capture more field lines or less field lines. Bigger area, smaller area, you'll capture more field lines or less field lines. So the area makes sense too. The N is just the number of turns of the, um, the coil, the number of loops of wire. So if you have one turn, and then you say, well, I want more electrical, electrical um, current. I want more electrical voltage. Uh, if you double it to two turns, you get twice, twice the induced EMF, twice the induced current. If you triple it to three turns, you get three times the induced current, three times the induced EMF. And typically, we might have hundreds or thousands of turns. To get hundreds or thousands of turns the, times the current and the EMF of just one simple turn. So it makes sense that it depends on N. Uh, every loop sees a rate of change of flux, and those rates of change of flux, those um, induced EMFs for every loop add together to make the total induced EMF, uh, the, the total induced EMF depending on the number of turns. Uh, then we've got some interesting bits. Look at this, omega sine omega t. So in the linear motion case, we had an equation BLV that depended on the speed of the linear motion. In the rotational motion case, the induced current, induced EMF, depends on the speed of the rotational motion. Omega is the angular velocity. So this o omega in this expression here is the kind of the parallel of the V in the linear generator in the, in the previous formula. So V and omega are playing similar roles. Um, one thing that this, this piece here tells you is that the faster that you rotate the coil of wire, i.e. the larger omega, the more the induced EMF, the more the induced current. And that's because you're changing the flux more rapidly. The smaller the induced, the, the omega, the angular velocity, then the smaller the, the induced EMF, smaller the induced current. And obviously if you stop turning this arrangement, omega zero, you're going to make no induced EMF, you're going to make no induced current. So this, this makes sense too. The sine omega t is an extra ingredient that comes about in the rotational motion. 
it's telling us something very important here, this piece. So if think about sine, think about the sine function. The sine function is something that's periodic. It swings backwards and forwards between plus one and minus one. It swings backwards and forwards between plus one and minus one with a certain frequency or a certain period. So when, when we're multiplying by um, sine omega t, we're multiplying by a function of time that oscillates in time. And so the, this equation is telling us that the induced EMF, the induced current in the rotational generator is not a constant, uniform EMF. Rather, it's an oscillating EMF, an oscillating current. Um, capture at one moment, and the current is going you know, clockwise around the circuit. A moment later, the current might be going counterclockwise around the circuit. So this rotational motion actually creates a sinusoidally varying a periodic uh, oscillating induced EMF, induced current. And we call this ordinating current as compared to the previous case of direct current. And so this sine omega t piece contains that information. You can see here that um, the maximum induced EMF is when sine omega t is maximum. So when sine omega t is 1 or minus 1, that's when you get the maximum induced EMF. But this thing does vary, and it varies at, with a frequency that's determined by how fast or slow you rotate this. And so, for example, when I said, you know, if the, the, out of the wall socket comes alternating current, AC, exactly this brand, uh, it, it's alternating at 60 cycles a second, at 60 hertz. That's uh, 377 radians per second. And it's it's coming out like that because somewhere in some power station is something rotating at that frequency to create that 60 hertz. And so you're seeing that rotational motion in uh, the uh, oscillation of the electrical, electrical current, the electrical voltage from a, from a power socket, from a wall socket. Okay. Why does it oscillate in that way? What is the origin of that sine omega t? Let me try and give you an, um, an idea of the, um, how it comes about. So let's look at this little picture here. So this picture here is kind of a side view of our three-dimensional sketch here. So we see the, this is the loop of wire in profile. Um, and there's a portion of the wire that's coming out of the screen towards you upstairs here on the left and then another portion that's going into the screen downstairs on the right. So that, this, is a, this is one arm of the wire, there's one arm below it, and then there's two, uh, a, a horizontal piece that goes into and out of the screen in this picture. Um, when the loop is rotating around, so here's the rotational motion in the magnetic field, at any moment, this, this wire upstairs here, or this wire downstairs here, has a, has a velocity that has a component, one component that's perpendicular to the magnetic field, so I indicated that with V perpendicular, and another component that is horizontal to the magnetic field. I've indicated that with these V parallel. So as the wire, as the loop rotates around, if you were to focus on the velocity of the wire, these, imagine these two wires rotating around. If you focus on the velocity of these two wires rotating around, at any moment there's some sort of combination of V perpendicular and V parallel. And that keeps changing. You know, when they're like this, it's all perpendicular. The next step is to go here, so it's all perpendicular. When they're like this, it's kind of all parallel. The next step is to go parallel. So, the mix of perpendicular and parallel is totally changing. Um, that is the origin of the sinusoidal variation of the induced current induced uh, EMF. The reason is the origin of the sinusoidal variation of the induced current and the induced EMF is that only V perpendicular, only V perpendicular creates um, uh, an electrical current. 
only its, only its motion creates an electrical current. V parallel does not create electrical current. You can think that if you move a charge parallel to the field lines, it experiences no force. So V parallel goes unnoticed in the generator. Any, any, in this generator, any horizontal motion parallel to the magnetic fields or opposite the magnetic fields is, 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 goes unnoticed in terms of creating electrical energy, electrical power. It's V perpendicular, the vertical motion, that creates the electrical energy and creates the electrical power. And um, that's, that's changing all the time. It's changing sinusoidally all the time. It's changing sinusoidally with the frequency of the rotation all the time. And that's where you get the sine omega t from. So it, it's not magic. It's just, you know, it's that the perpendicular motion to the magnetic field is inducing the EMFs. The parallel motion to the magnetic field is doing nothing. For the generator. Here's a, here's a picture. I will compare this with the um, direct current, DC case. This is what we get out of this rotational motion generator. It's what we call alternating current, AC. It's what's coming out of the wall socket. And it has a, um, a maximum voltage and maximum current that's determined by this little expression here, this piece of the formula for the generator, uh, but it varies sinusoidally between this maximum and troughs of this maximum at a frequency that's governed by the rotation frequency of the, um, uh, the coil in the generator. Okay. Here's a quiz question. So in this question, you're, you're shown three geometries of a coil in a uh, horizontal magnetic field. The, the, the green arrows are the field. So in one geometry, A, the, the coil is standing vertically. So the, here's my laptop. Imagine the edge of the laptop is the coil. In A, the laptop is standing vertically. So the wire runs around the edge of the laptop. In B, it's is in this horizontal plane. So the wire is running horizontally around here. And in uh, C, it's somewhere in between, in between the vertical and in between the uh, horizontal case. Which one of these generates the largest, e at that moment, is generating the largest EMF, is generating the maximum EMF? Which one of these three geometries? We said it varies sinusoidally as the, um, the coil rotates. Which one creates the maximum?
Okay, I'll get started because um, I want to fit in one problem, a uh, numerical problem on rotational motion. Is it, is it A? Is it B? Or it's probably unlikely it's somewhere in between, right? It's, I, I, I'm guessing you're thinking it's either A or it's B. It's B. When the coil is horizontal like this, what is the motion of these two pieces of wire on the left and right. Well, this one might be going up. This one might be going down. That's perpendicular to the magnetic field. As this wire goes up, at that moment, it's really traveling perpendicular to the magnetic field. Likewise for this one. This is traveling perpendicular to the magnetic field. That creates a big induced EMF. That's the maximum, where the, the coil is actually in the plane of the magnetic field lines. If we're vertical, what's the motion of this top wire and this bottom wire? We'll say the one on the top is going to be towards the uh, left of the room. The one on the bottom is going to be towards the right of the room. That's parallel to the magnetic field. That doesn't create any magnetic forces. And so the answer is B, this geometry where the velocity is perpendicular, not this geometry where the velocity is parallel. Okay, let's do a numerical example. Let's end up with that. Um, in this, this problem, it's, it's all about the situation of a, um, a rotational-based electrical generator. We're told uh, we've got a coil. We're told the area of the coil, the t number of turns of the coil. We're told the resistance of the coil. We're told how fast we rotate the coil. And we're told the magnetic field that we rotate it in, every one of those quantities is actually in the first line of this question, we've then got to find out the induced EMF and the induced current, uh, and then we're going to find out, uh, write down equations for the induced EMF and the induced current. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to switch to the document camera thing. See, why is this so hard for me? Okay, so I already started this problem. I, I already started it in that I made a sketch of the uh, coil. So here it is. Um, I'm seeing it as if it was a side view. So here's a side arm, uh, this angled line. Here's a arm at the top that's going where the current's say coming out of the screen, one at the bottom where the current's going into the screen. Here I'm indicating the rotational motion with a frequency of 60 revolutions a second. I've indicated with the horizontal lines the, the magnetic field and I've indicated down here all the features of the loop that we were told. We were told its area. We were told the number of turns. We were told the, um, the, the resistance of the loop. The first question asks what's the maximum induced EMF and what's the maximum induced current? So let's figure that out. Uh, maximum induced EMF. I'm going to call it epsilon subscript maximum, obviously. Um, that's given by our formula that describes this uh, type of generation, the rotational generator. And if, um, if I can remember, it looks like N, B, A, omega. There's a sine omega t, but we want the maximum. That's when sine omega t is what? Yeah. Oh, did I? What am I doing? <laughs> okay. That's better. Sorry. Got us. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me how this thing's laid out. All the controls are exactly where you put your hands. Why didn't they put them up here? Um, so now I'm stressed because I've got like two minutes to solve this problem or whatever. No, I haven't. I've got five, so it's not so bad. Um, number of turns of the coil. 
That was a thousand. Magnetic field, 0.2 Tesla. Area of the coil, 0.1 meter squared. And finally, the angular frequency. Now, we don't want it to get the right induced EMF. We don't want to put it in revolutions per second. This equation, the units for omega, are radians per second. So you've got to multiply the revolutions per second by 2 pi to calculate the number of radians per second. There are 2 pi radians in one revolution. So just like all the other units, the magnetic field, um, all the other quantities, magnetic field, area, you have to use the right units to get the, the EMF in, in, in volts. Uh, you have to use the uh, angular velocity in radi uh, radians per second. So if you multiply by 2 pi, it comes out to be 377. Uh, radians per second. And if we multiply all these numbers together, I got uh, 7,500 kilovolts. If we want the induced current, the maximum induced current, I call that I subscript M. That's, that's, that's easy too. We can just use Ohm's law at this point. Um, we've got an induced EMF. Uh, it's going to give an induced corresponding induced current just divide the induced EMF by the induced, uh, by the resistance, the resistance of the coil. So this is a, mess this up now. This is epsilon subscript M divided by the resistance to give us the current. This is Ohm's law. And if I plug in the numbers here, I'm going to get uh, 7,500 volts. This is wrong. Kilovolts. It is 7,500 volts. Uh, uh, 7,500 volts divided by um, how many ohms? 12 ohms. And it, I've already done that too, 625 amps. Look, step back at that one. That's a big difference. I remember back to the, um, the generator based on the tran uh, translational motion, the linear motion. Uh, in that case, we got currents that were and, and voltages that were millivolts and, and milliamps. Now we're getting kilovolts uh, and kiloamps of currents. So this is a very, very practical way of gener generating large amounts of electrical energy, electrical power. Uh, if we want to write an equation for the EMF, so let's say I want to write down how the EMF varies with time. That's what I mean by this little arrangement here with T in parentheses. Well, it will just be the maximum E of F, so 7,500 times the sine function, 377 times T. So that's the EMF as a function of time. That little equation there describes the EMF that's coming out of the electrical generator. I could do the same thing for the current. What's the current as a function of time? Uh, I would multiply the maximum current, 625, by again, sine of 377 times time. And so those are equations that describe the, uh, the, the current and the EMF that's uh, produced by the generator. Um, the, the last part of this uh, question, I, I've run out of time, but let me just say a few words about it. It says, calculate the applied torque needed to rotate the coil. We realized in the translational motion generator, we had to apply a force to move the, the rod against the magnetic force. Exactly the same is true here. You have to apply a torque, a turning force, to turn the coil against the magnetic torque. So there is an exact parallel here. The magnetic torque we had previously talked about about a week ago. That magnetic torque is equal to mu, the magnetic moment of the coil, times B, the magnetic field that the coil is immersed in, times sine of the angle of the coil. In the, in the field. That would be sine omega t. So if you want to work out the torque that you apply and the magnetic torque that you're opposing, you would just use that formula 
for the uh, magnetic torque on a magnetic dipole, a, a loop of wire, that is um, the torque equals mu b sine theta. And that, that's, it's in my notes here for this, but that's how you would that solve that part. Um, I'm going to end there. We spent the whole class on two types of generators. We saw the importance of Faraday's law of induction in our modern lifestyles in generating our electrical power. We met the translational motion case. It's a simpler example. It allows us to understand the details of it. It's not practical. We met the rotational case. It's a little more complicated, but it is literally how all our power is made with this um, rotational motion in a magnetic field.